see me, Chris, you have this on. Congratulations. Well done. Our new AV guy in the back booth there. Congratulations, Chris Boyce. You've had a promotion. It's so good to see all of you here. It's kind of a cool night that what we had planned. Somebody from the outside who has a different perspective and a history of, of working with youth, all kinds of youth. And youth that have a, this kind of a warm story to youth that have an unbelievably exciting story. So we are excited to have Joel and his wife Christy with us tonight. Before we get started, let's open up with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we are thankful. We are thankful for every person in this room, and we are thankful for those who are watching on live stream and Facebook and YouTube. Lord, we are thankful that we can be together again in your name. And Lord, where there's two or more, you will be also, and we recognize that tonight in your name. Father, thank you for Joel and Christy and their ministry and for their opportunity and their willingness to be here and to speak to us, not just the youth, but to all of us. There's something for us to do here. And Lord, in Joel's story is your story. And the same thing for Christy. Thank you for Joel and Christy. And thank you for the opportunity to share with them more about you and how you are an awesome God. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So tonight, uh, we are so happy to have Joel and Christy hang out with us tonight. Uh, Joel's background is really kind of cool. It's just really cool. Um, he has had many different experiences, particularly working with young people. Uh, if you go backwards, you, you get to the point of where he actually... Um, in his martial arts experience, he's had an opportunity to work with youth. He's had an opportunity to work with troubled youth. He's had an opportunity to work with youth who have had some very, very specific issues, <coughs> some with learning disabilities, some with physical disabilities, but all of it he has had an opportunity to share Christ with them, and it's been awesome to have them with us. And tonight I want you to remember that as we we think about somebody in the professional uh, sphere in youth ministry working with youth. Um, it just kind of means that you have an expertise that we don't have here in this room. And we're so excited to have Joel with us. So, Joel, welcome and thank you. And by the way, we're going to have Q&A &E at the end. And so please let us know if you have Q&A &E and any other questions. Joel will have the answer. You have the question. check, mic check, on the button. Okay. Well, as I said, my name's Joel. Uh, I'm a walker, so we're going to have to follow along with this. I'm going to give you all of it right now. Uh, the, w the first thing I want to do is make a point about, as I was talking earlier to the pastor, about how we look at people and how we perceive them and how we perceive them as Christians. So, a lot of times, and I've done this myself, we look at people uh, in society and we say, well, this person, look at that guy, or look at that girl. They really need Christ. Just by the way they dress or the tattoos, clothes, whatever. And people with tattoos do the same thing. They look at other people and they want to see that and say, well, that's my guy. That's somebody who thinks he's somebody, thinks he's better than me, right? And we judge. But what we don't know is what's in that person's heart. Right, And the word tells us that God judges a man by his heart, not by his outward appearance. Right? We learned that through King David. Right? There's so many different, uh, King David had some great brothers. They were probably all pretty muscular, right? pretty good in shape. They all looked like they'd be good kings, and then they had David. And everybody was like, I don't think this is the right David. But God knew David's heart, right? And God looked at him uh, by his heart. He didn't look at him by his size, his stature, um, his profession, what he was doing, what he'd spent his time doing. And we need to do the same thing. 
And when we're talking about youth, that's the number one thing we need to look at. Because we have a lot of youth that are in our society today that feel left out, that feel misunderstood, that feel unaccepted, even by the church. And because of maybe the way they look, something they're going through or struggling with, and things that they just feel like they can't um, relate to anybody on. And this is just so very important, that we look at everybody at their heart as an individual and not how they look on the outward. We have to do that, right? We're not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is what moves and operates and does God's will, not us. So we can't look at somebody and say, well, you're not worthy or you're not worthy. You're not good. You have no idea what God is doing in someone's life or what he's doing through their life, right? So I've learned that. We should all learn that. So I'm going to give you a little background on me, all right? So I grew up back in a, I will just tell you, there was an eight and a zero in the years. I don't want to say the years, but there was an eight and a zero in those years. So it's been a little while back. But back then, it was the heavy metal rock and roll age. Now, I know you guys are more into like a lot of your like rap, hip hop, and different things. I don't know what you listen to. But uh, back then, heavy metal rock and roll was the big thing. And all the parents hated rock and roll, right? Everybody thought it was just, it was the end of all ends. And I grew up in a, in a home, in a broken home. I grew up in a violent home. I grew up. Um, a home without God, without any type of uh, background in uh, church. Uh, I wasn't taught anything to do with the Lord or the gospel. Um, I went through a childhood where there was just a lot of trauma and a lot of abuse and a lot of fear, a lot of anxiety. And as I become a teenager, a lot of that turned into uh, other things like rage and anger. Um, I was locked up several times as a teenager. I was in uh, locked facilities like David C. Wilson and Mountain Wood and these places. And I kept searching for something through that time for somebody to love me, somebody to reach out, somebody to really be there for me. But I, I just never came across that person. Um, at one point as a teen, um, I got into Satanism. I got into the occult. This was kind of a, a trendy thing back in the 80s. So a lot of people were um, into the occult and Satanism, wearing shirts and things like that, especially in rock and roll, but they weren't really into it. But I always took things to another level. So being so desperate to find power in my life and feel some type of worth and power and control over the things that had hurt me and harmed me and made me feel powerless, I really got into the occult, and I literally gave my life over to Satan. So here's a kid that really has no understanding about God, but was deeply uh, getting involved in Satan and Satanism and reading books on the occult and, and things like that. And as I got deeper into that, my life, of course, just got worse. At one point, um, I found myself on the streets. I was probably 12 or 13 the first time that I got uh, locked into a facility. Uh, I think I was 12 when I went in, 13 when I came out, which was really traumatic. Uh, it was really hard to be a 12-year-old and be locked up. Um, but when I came out of there, I found that I really had no place to go. So my home life was so broken that I ended up on the streets. I spent most of my time on the streets from... 13, 14 on, I was out on the streets on my own. I took care of myself. Um, I tried to stay in school and go to school, but I slept on couches. I, I stayed with uh, parents who would let me crash at their house for a while, and usually those weren't the best parents. They were probably doing bad things themselves. Um, and my life just kept spiraling more and more out of control. What I didn't know the whole time is that God had his hand on my life the whole time. Now, I had an aunt in my life, and she's with the Lord now. But she was one shining light in my life, and she worked for Capitol Records. And so when the holidays, she would always make sure that uh, she caught up with me, and she gave me some albums and records, and they were always, you know, heavy metal rock and roll albums. 
So it was that one shining thing. Wow, I'm going to get something, you know. My aunt's always going to get me something cool. But what she got me was an album from the band Striper. Does anybody in here know who Striper is? Anybody? All right, in the back. Very good. Okay, all right. Well, Striper is a Christian rock band, and they were kind of controversial back in the 80s because they were very, very different. And um, they had long hair, and they had, you know, the look, but they were preaching the gospel of Christ to people, all right? And uh, I see people laughing over there because, you, yeah, you know you remember Striper. That's right. Yeah, yeah uh-huh. You have to admit it. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, for me, I remember sitting there on a Christmas day, and I've got a couple of different, you know, uh, cassettes. I think they were actually not even albums at that time. But, and I'm going through them, and I'm listening to them, and I come to this Striper album. It's called The Yellow and Black Attack. And they had uh, uh, their, their design was striper, and then it said Isaiah 53.5, right? And I didn't know anything about the Bible. So I started listening to uh, the album. And after just maybe a song or two, it was very, very apparent. It was loud, it was metal, it was rock, but they were screaming and yelling and singing about Jesus Christ and salvation. And it wasn't watered down. It was very much straight out of the scriptures. And something came over me that I never felt. Something came over me that I had been looking for, but I didn't know what it was. That was the Holy Spirit. Because that music is anointed. There was a lot of people, even back then, that looked at that, even church people, and they said, oh, my gosh, look at this. Can you believe this? <laughs> this is the devil's music. Well, it's because they didn't understand, but they don't have to understand because God moves and works through whatever God wants to work through. And he'll use whatever he has to use to reach anyone that he needs to reach. And he doesn't ask any of us for permission to do so. I don't listen to a lot of bluegrass or country, nothing against it, right? I'm just kind of that old kind of rock and roll type of guy. But God may use gospel and bluegrass and country to reach people. It may be a tool that, that the Holy Spirit uses to work through. So it doesn't matter if I like it or not, right? So there I sat, and I felt this feeling come over me. And all of a sudden, I went this this hardcore kid, you know, that was fighting. Now, I want you to get an image of me, too, because I haven't really described the image. I had a mohawk that was about up to here. It was different colors, okay? Um, Combat boots, leather jacket, chains, spike bracelets, uh, a leather jacket. And on the back of the leather jacket, it literally said, and I painted this myself, God is dead. Okay? That's how far I was as far as in the Satanism and angry and just mad at the world. And I didn't know it, but I was projecting that towards God, even though I didn't even know God. But when the spirit came over me in that car, I thought, what is this? I started bawling like a five-year-old. And I said, well, you know, what's happening? What's happening here? I, uh, I don't cry. I'm a tough guy. I don't cry. And the music just, it just went through me. It just went through me. Now, was it, was it those guys? Was it the music? No. It was the Holy Spirit working through that. It was the anointing that God had put on that group and that group of men who were out doing God's will and preaching the gospel of Christ to teens and young people and people of all ages, I suppose, all across the world. They were getting the message out to millions. So I said, I'm going to read some of these lyrics that some of you maybe remember back. There used to be lyrics. Do you remember that? You guys don't know that, do you, right? Because you got iTunes, so maybe you don't worry about lyrics, but we had, like, you know, pull it out, and you had to read it. Oh, never mind. But <laughs> maybe we'll talk about it another time. All right? <laughs> but so I pulled out the, uh, the cassette, you know, the little jacket inside, and I started reading through the songs, and it was talking about um, Jesus Christ and what he had did and what he did on the cross and what that meant for me and what that would do for my life. And Striper always had inside of their jacket the sinner's prayer. So after you read the lyrics, it would always say, if you'd like to make Jesus Christ the Lord of your life, 
Have your sins forgiven. Become a new creation in Christ. Read this prayer. And I did. And then the Spirit of God came into my life. Now, I didn't even know what was happening. Remember this. I didn't know. So I felt different. I felt changed. I, I, I could just feel this presence that I had never experienced before. Um, but I didn't know what to do with it, right? It's like, um, you know, not knowing how to play golf and somebody gives you a whole set of clubs. Well, <laughs> this is awesome, but where do I go from here? So I, I tried to read the Bible, and as I've talked before publicly, uh, I talk about the, the King James, which is, uh, was always humorous to me because I had such a hard time understanding it as a teenager. It said, Thee, thou, thou, and then thou is goeth down to thy ass. And I was just lost. I was like, I don't, okay, I don't, I don't get it. I don't understand. So I tried my best, but having nobody in my life to guide me, there was nobody to support that or to guide me. I told several people, adults in my life at the time, hey, you know, I just accepted Jesus. And they're all like, Pfft. and? So maybe after a few weeks or so, I went kind of just started gradually, you know, going back to just the same old thing because I didn't understand what I was supposed to be doing or where to go from there. So we'll go down a, a few months later, uh, maybe six months later or so. Um, I was out on the streets, running the streets. And I, like I said, I was always staying somewhere, sleeping from place to place. And as crazy and wild as I looked, most of the time when I did find some place like somebody's parents or a friend's parents to say, let me crash on the couch, um, they would look at me and be like, uh, son, come here. You know, can you tell that guy, look at this guy, nah, he's not going to stay here. So uh, I had nowhere to go one night. I had nowhere to go. I was at the end of my rope, and so I decided I was going to try to go home, and I was going to ask my mother to let me stay the night, just this one night. Now, this is the middle of January, mind you, and I think it was probably about 15 degrees. It was freezing out, and I had a leather jacket, and that's it. So I made my way there, and I asked, and she said, yeah, you can stay here out on the porch, which was not an enclosed porch. It was just an outside porch, and I became enraged, just absolutely enraged. I think it just... Something came over me that night that just took over me, literally. And I felt like, not inside of me, and I know now, I was saved. But that didn't mean that the enemy couldn't attack me and oppress me. And that's what he did that night. And he said, you know what? This is, this is a hard one to take in. But he said, you need to do away with this woman. These people have treated you terribly. They're treating you terrible today. You have nowhere to go. You're at the end of your rope. What does it matter? Take her out. So I walked to my grandmother's house. It was just a little ways from her house. And I went to my grandmother's house, and she had a, a you know, number of, of guns in her house. And I said, I'm going to take this gun, and I'm going to get my vengeance on people. And that's where I was as a teenager. And, and in that moment, Satan was doing everything he could to stop what he knew was coming, which is me. And when I reached my grandmother's house, I went in, said a few words. Uh, I loved my grandmother, no issue with her. And I went about to look for what I was looking for, which was a weapon. And I was going to go back and deal out the justice that I felt was appropriate. Right? The world had wronged me, so I was going to wrong the world back. And before I got a chance to do that, the phone rang. And on the other end, my grandmother said, hey, you've got a phone call. And I thought, i got a phone call at my grandmother's house? I come here about five times a year. I, you know. But on the other end was a guy from school that I was in class with. I didn't know him real well, but he was a rock and roll type of guy. And, you know, we all stuck together. So uh, I had seen him uh, earlier, and he had seen me actually laying downtown on a downtown mall, hanging out on a bench at night. And he was walking through with some friends, going somewhere, and he said, hey, what are you doing? I told him, I got nowhere to go. I got nowhere to sleep. I'm just crashing here, you know. And, uh, and most of the time I was high. Most of the time I was high on some sort of drug. 
And, uh, and I was high that night when I went to my grandmother's. So I'd like to throw that out there because drugs are a gateway. I know that we're getting in our society to where it, we're kind of getting open to the idea of, of certain drugs being legal and things like that. And a lot of time, um, teenagers and young people uh, have this thrown in their face a lot. And uh, it is a gateway to other things. And it does open up doorways for the enemy to attack you and to gain control of you in certain ways. Um, so I took the phone, and the guy was on the phone from school. And I said, how did you get this number? And he said, man, I called all over the place trying to get this number. And somebody said, you know what? The guy might be at his grandma's house. You know, this is the number. I got and so he got it from another person that I knew. And he made his way there. Which we know now God was working. So God was moving through people to get to me before Satan could use me to do something that would ruin my life and other people's lives. Because God had plans for me, had bigger plans for me than that. So he said, hey, look, the reason I'm trying to get a hold of you is I talked to my dad, right? And, and I told my dad your situation, and my dad said to uh, find you and tell you to come over here and you can spend the night here. You know, spend a few nights or whatever, you know, get on your feet. And I said, wow, okay. And that just changed the whole course of my thinking, right? Because the, the, the whole anger dissipated as all of a sudden I felt like there was a little hope again in life, you know? And that became a thought in the back of my mind now, not in the front of my mind. So now I was excited I had a place to go. And I just changed the whole course of my thinking for that evening. And I said, yeah. I said, but how am I going to get there? Because he lived out in Stephen City. And he said, I'm going to come pick you up. He said, I'll come pick you up. And, uh, him and a couple other guys came, and they picked me up, my grandmother's, and we went back to his house, and I walked up to his house, and the first thing I'm always thinking is that, okay, look at me. Here we go, right? Walking in, I got ripped jeans and spikes, and, and my hair's crazy, and I got eyeliner on, and, uh, you know, I was just all just heavy metaled out, punk rock, you know. And I walk in the house, I'm expecting a typical response, and what I got was the opposite. His father came up to me, and I try to talk about this man because he's recently passed away without getting emotional. It's very difficult for me to do that. But I walked in. His father looked at me, did not even do a double take, reached out, grabbed a hold of me, gave me a hug. He said, welcome. You're welcome in my home. Our family welcomes you here. I want you to get something to eat, get something to drink, get warm, and then get a good night's sleep. I said, wow, wonderful. You know, he didn't look at me up and down. He didn't judge me. He didn't say you can't wear that or any of that. He just showed me unconditional love. And then it was I uh, found out uh, just a little while later that he is a pastor. And he had his own church. And his whole family were Christians. And that was the first time that I had been in, in that kind of situation and, uh, around Christians. And God had taken me exactly where he wanted me to be it was just unreal so the next morning I woke up and I got my stuff together as I was you know used to doing and getting ready to head out the door and find my next stop and he came up to me and he said you know what he said can I talk to you for a minute I said yeah he said I talked to my family last night we spoke about this and we would like you to come live here with us and be a part of our family no strings attached We'll, we'll help you, uh, you know, get straight in school. We'll help you uh, get a job if you want. Um, if you want that, we're offering it to you. And I, and I, and I, right, I said, yes, <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. So what happened over the course of time of, of living there is I started going to his church. He never made me go to his church. He was a Pentecostal preacher. He never made me go to church. He never made me change the way I look. He never said, you're not gonna, but if you live here, you're not going to look like that. You're not going to dress like that. He showed me unconditional love like Christ. And that's something that we lack a lot in today, I think, in the Christian community is unconditional love. When we, do, when we treat other people and the way we talk to other people and the way we interact with other people, we have to ask ourselves, if Jesus was here, how would he act towards that person? How would he treat that person? According to his word, how would he do it? Are we acting the same way? Are we treating people the same way? If you can say yes, great. You're, you know, you're on a good path. Keep, keep going. 
But if you don't, and that's not how you treat people, then you need to kind of check yourself and get deeper into the Word and closer to the Lord. It's only when we walk with God that we really experience the, the amazing power of God. It's not about coming to church on Sunday for an hour and going home and then doing whatever the rest of the week. It's about every day giving your time to be with God, to seek him, to spend time alone with him, to read his word, to spend time in prayer. This is how you really come to know God in a supernatural way and not just in a book. You have to have a relationship, right? So over that period of time, I built a relationship. I didn't realize I was, but I was going to church. I was learning God's word. And slowly but surely, here's this kid with a mohawk. He went from a jacket that says, God is dead on the back, to a jacket that said, Striper 777, Rock for God. And I was at the mall, a wild rock and roll, punk rock looking Christian kid, born again, filled with the Holy Spirit, full of the word, and I was passing out tracks and preaching to other teenagers. So God took me from that to that. And all of this, God has always had his hand on my life, and I've had you know, good seasons and bad seasons, we all do. We all have our ups and downs. We have times that we're close to God, and sometimes we feel like God is so far away, we can't find him. But we know he's always there. He's always there. And you guys, the youth, you are the key to everybody around you. Because if other kids who are dealing with depression, anxiety, maybe suicide, there may be things that they're dealing with that you know, no one knows about. But you're the light to them because if you can share the gospel with them, you can give them that hope that I got. So it's, it's just so very important. But to be yourself and be genuine. You don't have to preach at them, you know. You don't have to go in and hit them over the head with the Bible. You just have to show that you care, that you love them, and they'll see Jesus th through you. I've always told people that. How do, you get your, how do you get your kids to follow Christ and to live a Christian life? It's not by taking things away or, 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 or making rules and breaking, uh, you know, uh, breaking the books over their head or whatever. It's not about any of that. What it is is if you live it and, and it's shining through you, they're going to want it and they're going to follow it. And if you have the power of God in your life, they're not going to be able to run from it. Believe me. So, to end up, because I know I'm about out of time, and I'm a talker, so maybe one day there'll be a part two. We can, we can do uh, seasons, like this is season one, and season two, like Netflix, season three, and maybe in season four we could act it out. We could get people up. <laughs> I could do the help you with the wardrobe and the hair and everything. Okay? Yeah, it's going to be great. But uh, <laughs> just remember... <laughs> Did do we have any? Did you want to do the Q and A? Was there time for that? Or uh, yeah. Yeah. So you open with asking you what's what was your last name? Sing has. Sing has. Uh huh. Like sing and has, <laughs> but sing has. <laughs> Families around the area, there's a lot of sing houses in the area. Yeah, yeah. Oh, cool. <laughs> Very good. Very good. Sure, yes, yes. Yes, I was asked what my last name was. I said sing has, as you already heard. Which is why you were in the Rock and Roll. That's right. Yeah, I, was, I would sing it for you, but, you know, I'm a little... A little horse today. <laughs> no singing, that's right. That is not a gift. <laughs> so, Joel, will you tell us a little bit of what you do for a living? Mm -hmm. um, well, I do have, uh, I have a ministry that's called Holy Fire, if that's what we're talking about. Um, and we're partnered with a uh, another group called For the Love of Josh. And... Uh, 
that is a foundation that's run by a wonderful, amazing Christian family uh, who tragically lost their son to suicide. Um, and so what we do is we try to reach out to teens, especially uh, teens that, uh, uh, like, my, like I was, may not uh, have the chance to hear the gospel or have heard the gospel. And uh, we try to, a lot of times we have to start from the ground up um, because they don't know anything about God at all, uh, the same as I did. Um, and some of them do, and maybe they have trouble with believing or understanding, or they just really aren't that interested. So we try to build a relationship with them and then go from there. And eventually, like I said, um, I think when you love somebody and you're there for somebody and you develop a meaningful relationship that's not judgmental, uh, they start to wonder what it is about you that's different. And that opens the door to say, Jesus, that's what's different. And then they can accept it more, right? And then they can actually have faith in it and faith that Christ loves them and he's real because they've already seen it and experienced them through you. That's why I say so, it's so important. It's so important, you know? Yeah. We, you may be the only Bible people ever see, yeah. Richie, I think you had a question, didn't you? Yeah, how do you connect them to like parents and high schoolers? Like what's your, what's your, I just saw a, a 250 kids in Kaiser all from a high school met for a revival. So you know, how, how do you connect with high schoolers? So I'll repeat the question. Uh, so Richie asked, how do you connect with high schoolers? He just was at a revival with 250 youth. And so, um, yeah, how, how do you see connecting with high schoolers? Um, well, uh, you know, what we do is God seems to provide uh, a lot of uh, the kids and a lot of the teenagers uh, that we talk to um, through different various people and things, churches. Uh, sometimes it's just through um, alternative types of situations. Um, well, we're out uh, and about. We're always uh, trying to share the gospel and ministry as well. So if we're at a school where we're out, we're trying to share, we're trying to talk to people. Um, the other, uh, For the Love of Josh Foundation, um, she does a tremendous amount of work bringing in kids. She, she's just like a magnet for teenagers, and uh, they love her because she is so genuine, and um, she really shows the love of, of Christ as well. And uh, she gets a lot of them in. And uh, she's almost like uh, the person that goes out and gets the sheep, you know? And then I'm the guy that's uh, talking to a lot of them. Yeah. Um, so that's pretty much you know, how we do it. Good. Other questions? Yeah, Rochelle? Who was the pastor that you used to live with? His name was Pastor Bo Bounds. And he was uh, the pastor of Axe Christian Fellowship Church, which mm -hmm. I don't know if some of you may remember. Mm -hmm. um, it was a country church, Pentecostal church. And the Bounds family was an amazing family, just absolutely amazing family. Uh, he had uh, two daughters and one son, and uh, they were all uh, wonderful people and still very, very special to me. Uh, his wife as well, Irma. And uh, I, God just used them so strongly. And still to today, I, I oftentimes will uh, look at myself and say, you know, how would Pastor Bo have dealt with this? How would Pastor Bo do this? Because he was just a loving, loving man. Yeah. And he would take his, if you had no shoes, he would give you his shoes. And uh, he didn't want anything in return for them. So he set the, he set the bar pretty high. Other questions? So you've actually you've actually worked some in uh, the juvenile system, I understand. I worked in the juvenile system, yes, for six years in juvenile detention. Um, I worked for six, seven years in residential for young adults um, struggling with uh, drug addiction and uh, other issues. Um, some of them were, it was as simple as uh, they had anxiety disorders. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them were addicted to drugs, like I said, some of them were alcohol. Uh, but yeah, we worked, I've worked in the detention center. I've worked in uh, uh, <laughs> just various different places. Um, and I've always had a chance to share Christ with everybody. Uh, I went through a time in my life, and if you watch uh, on YouTube, if you watch uh, my whole testimony, I think we talked about it, I'm not sure. Uh, but there's a part two to it. Because there was a time in my life where I fell away from God. 
as a, as a younger adult. Uh, and the story, the testimony of God rearing me back in is absolutely mind blowing. So that's a great part too, right? Uh, but um, yeah. Good. So um, we know that statistically up to a third of teenage girls consider suicide because of the way they see themselves, because of pressure in society and social pressure, school pressure, peer pressure. Um, and there may be somebody watching online or even sitting in our, our group today that, that it may have crossed their mind. They may say, you know, it's not worth moving on. What, since you have worked with so many young people in this area, what, what's, your, what's, a, what's a message that you share with them? Just that, uh, you know, first, find somebody, and this is why it's so important that we all try to become that person, but find somebody in your life, whether it's a friend, whether it's a counselor, whether it's a teacher. Um, I had one teacher in high school that was also uh, very special to me. She seemed through all the get up and right to the heart. She was uh, important in my life as well. But find a teacher, find somebody that you can trust and tell them how you feel. And remember that God is real. I'm telling you, God is real, right? If we seek him, he'll make himself known to us, right? If you seek him, he'll manifest himself to you. Absolutely. And, uh, and those two things together are so important because, you know, God uses people. And if we're not obedient to him, maybe you're in a store, maybe you have a neighbor friend, or maybe it could be anybody. And you feel that nudging of the Holy Spirit to go over and talk to that person. Or, or, or speak a word to that person. Or, or to share the gospel with that person. And you don't do it. The Bible says that we're in sin. If you know the right thing to do and you fail to do it, you're sinning. And that person may very well be the person you're talking about. Because God always sends somebody to a person. I believe that always. He sent people to me to stop me and change my life. And it's about those people being obedient. What if Pastor Bo had not been obedient and said, well, you know, we really got church and we don't have time to bring some guy in here and fool with all that. My whole life could have been different. Yeah. That's about being obedient. But yes, if you're feeling like you want to take your life or life's not worth, uh, worth living anymore, remember that there are people that love you, there are people that, that are willing to talk to you, and there are people that are willing to talk to you privately and you don't, and we won't tell everybody else about it. And I think that's a big thing with today. It is such a big problem we have, and even in the church community, is gossip and talk. And when somebody comes to you with something that important, right, and that desperate, make sure you keep it to yourself. You need to go to the pastor and talk privately, then do that. But don't talk to the neighbors about it. Don't talk to the, the Joneses about it and say, hey, did you know that so and so's kid is, you know, wants to take their life, that's what they told me. Don't do that. Make sure that you build trust with people. Make sure that you're honest with them and that you're open with them. And I think that's the number one thing I can say is find somebody, if you feel that way, that you can talk to, that you can trust, and just share how you feel. And you deal with, um, I'm sorry, I don't want to take everybody. Anybody else have a question? Yes, Sandy Miller and back. So you were involved in the cult, uh, cult at one time. So the question is, what's your view of Halloween? Well, I'll tell you my view on Halloween. <laughs> we don't hang up ghosts. We don't hang up um, things that have to do with uh, spiritual matters. What we do do is uh, we put up some fall decorations. We did this year. And when the kids come around, they get a little candy, but they get a candy uh, with a track taped to it about Christ. So we take the opportunity to talk to those kids about Jesus because God's bringing them right to your door, right? Um, so no, we don't involve ourselves really with the Halloween, the spookiness and all that, no. Uh, but what we do is we take something that was originally a, a pagan tradition, which it was, and we turn it around uh, to use it as the glory of God. So, uh, and that's what we did this past year. So we passed out a whole lot of tracks and 
Yeah. In, in all of your work with young people, uh, not all of it is that they're in danger, but you, you, a lot of that seems to be where your ministry is drawn to, obviously, because that's where God's pulled you out of. Um, what do you think is one thing that you would caution the church? Obviously, it affects the young people, but talk to us old folks here for a moment. What's, what's one of the things that we need to be aware of? When it comes to our youth, mm -hmm. um, what I said before, not judging them. And bringing yourself down to their level and figuring out where they're at. And I have children. They're all grown. But they listen to uh, different type of music. You know, but I'm talking about my youngest daughter. Uh, she's a Christian. She's on fire. And, but she listens to a different type of Christian music than I do. I'm like, I don't understand it. Why don't you listen to Christian heavy metal? <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. You know? Why don't you listen to Striper? And she's like, oh, what are they, like 80 years old now, right? <laughs> and they're not. We just saw Striper in September last year. They were wonderful. Yeah. Um, but the number one As they thing, wheeled them out in wheelchairs. No. Oh. <laughs> they were very nimble. You know. <laughs> but, uh, you, yeah, but you do know that it's fascinating a little bit when you go to the Striver concert and you think it's going to be, you know, uh, all these young people when you look around and everybody's, everybody's just like... Yeah, yeah. It's like, okay. They're all Greg Myers' yeah, age, right? right? This, yeah. This is supposed to be an uplifting thing, and I feel really depressed. <laughs> but, um, yeah, first, listen to them. Don't judge them. Don't yell at them. And if they tell you something that you don't like hearing, or if they're doing something or struggling with something in their life personally that, that shocks you or upsets you, stop, take a minute, seek God about it. Let the Holy Spirit do the Holy Spirit's job and then go back and tend to the situation, right? But the number one thing is you, you have to be a parent, but you, you can still be their friend and be their parent. You can still be there for them, listen to what they have to say. Understand that there's a different generation, different words, different things. But that you don't have to understand it all. You just have to love them, listen to them, make sure they feel comfortable enough coming to you, especially as Christian parents, to tell you those things. Because that's where a lot of times uh, these tragedies happen, where they just don't feel like they have anybody to go to. I felt that way, right? And I just was about to explode that night, right? Because I had nobody to go to, to to talk to. I had plenty of friends to go to to do drugs with or drink with. Nobody to go to to talk about my feelings or how I felt, but that's when God sent Pastor Bo and his family into my life so that I had what I needed. And so we just need to be that. We all need to be a Pastor Bo for somebody, mm. and, and for our own kids especially, right? But live it, live it, because your kids are always watching you. And that's one thing I've learned. When I mess up, I always go to my kids. We all mess up. We all do things wrong, right? None of us are perfect. Forget that. It's never going to happen. <laughs> but we're doing a striving to be the person God wants us to be, but we're never going to make it there, right? Until we're with him in eternal glory. But on earth, we're always going to be striving for it. If you have a relationship with God, you're going to be striving for it. You should be, right? So definitely, yeah, just um, love them. Let them, allow them to come to you and, and tell you. Uh, what they need to say and what they need to get off their chest and be an example for them of Christ. And if you mess up, make sure they're aware of it too. Because when I mess up, I, I, I tell my, my kids, I say, listen, listen, you know, I got upset today about the guy that was tailgating me, <laughs> you know, all the way home. And I came home and I was grumbling and griping about it and really wasn't showing the right reaction. Um, but you know what, I'm not perfect, but Jesus is perfect, I'm not. So remember that I'm not always an example of his perfection, right? I'm just a work in progress. But that way we always keep it in context. That even if you mess up, even if you're wrong, God is there for you and you can talk about it and you just keep going, keep trying. 
So you have a common thread in a lot of the things that you've said tonight, which I absolutely love and, and agree with, and that is this, this thing of relationship and then not being judgmental but to live and love unconditionally. What, what was a common thread that reached the troubled teens that you worked with for those six, seven years while you were in that system? Um, well, I think for me, a lot of the, a lot of the teens uh, work with that, that come from, a lot of them come from bad backgrounds and they come from um, dysfunctional homes or families or violent pasts or uh, drug abuse and things. So they can relate to me. And because I have tattoos and things like that, a lot of times it just kind of automatically, uh, they lower their guard. Um, and, uh, and, and it just kind of opens that doorway to where a lot of other people, they may look at and say, well, you don't get me, you don't understand me, you're, you know, you're just an old person, you don't, you know, uh, you don't get me. But they, a lot of times they'll, they'll look at me or talk to me and I get a chance to talk to them about where I've been and they say, man, you know, you, you live the life that I'm living now. So it really opens that door. So. You offer hope. I, I hope. I, you yeah. know, I offer them Jesus. He offers them hope. Yeah, yeah. Good, you know, good. I don't do anything. I just try to be obedient. And that's all we can do. If we're obedient, then Amen. it's work out. If we're obedient, it works. Any final questions? Anybody want to know about any good Christian heavy metal rock bands <laughs> that you might want to listen to when you get home that are... Well, well we have a couple of musicians in our midst, and I'm not right. sure. I believe they could probably play any music that any of us listen to. They're well, very talented. Is. So, yeah, okay. we're very fortunate. So Next Sunday, Striper songs for uh, worship <laughs> service. There you go. There you go. <laughs> Greg, you'd probably sing with that, wouldn't you? I'll take all the old fogey uh, bands that you have. I'll take that. Okay. <laughs> I think we got something going here. You do. You do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the Led Zeppelin? At one time I did. I had a treasured Led Zeppelin shirt one time when I was younger. Yes, I did. Yeah. Yeah, Steve Campbell sleeps in his. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And Grateful Dead. He's, he's a deadhead. Yeah. <laughs> There is. I mean, that's a, that's a really good thing to bring up because, like, for you guys, I don't know, what, what kind of music do you guys listen to? Everything. Everything. I mean, I'm just asking, right? Because I'm learning all this. One thing I learned, like, working with uh, young people is all the new language, right? We had awesome and dude yeah. and all that, and you've kept a few words, but you've added some new ones. Like, awesome, that's our word. So if you say it, that's ours, right? <laughs> right? But I had to learn, like, bet, you know what I mean? Because I'd say, hey, you, you guys want to go play basketball? And they're like, bet. I'm like, on oh, what? <laughs> what are you talking about? We can't gamble here. What do you mean? You're locked up. <laughs> yeah. Some of them are going to be going to a Toby Mac concert. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, well, they say, oh, that's fire. I'm like, yeah, what? What? That's, well, that's fire, yeah. But every generation is different. But you guys listen to a little bit of everything, right? So there's a lot of really great uh, Christian uh, bands out there. So if you love God uh, and you want to listen to something that, that praises him, uh, there are so many different Christian hip-hop, rap, rock, alternative, country, whatever, you name it. And, uh, and it's improved a lot since the 80s. Well, I say that as well. <laughs> Some of the Christian uh, music in the 80s, you know. I think it, we're going down that road now. Yeah, as a, as a pastor, I'm learning things about people. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Final questions? Christy and Joel, thank you so much for being here today. Thank wonderful, you. wonderful ministry. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, you're you're going to be here for a few minutes, so if somebody has any questions after we wrap up, please don't hesitate to come up. And